Max, the one to watch for the best in entertainment, now has live sports with the Bleacher Report sports add-on. Stream hundreds of select live games from MLB. That's gonna go! NBA, NHL, U.S. soccer, and NCAA men's March Madness. And it's all included for a limited time with any Max subscription. He got it. After the promo period, add it for $9.99 a month. Base subscription required. This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash Infinity. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello, everyone. It's Mina from the Serie A Chronicles podcast. Um, we are going to have a main show. It's just going to come a little bit later in this week because Nikki Bandini is in New York and she's arriving today quite late. And of course, there's the Champions League matches to watch. So we decided to make the main show on Thursday. So bear with us where we'll be able to then round up all the action in Europe and also reflect going ahead to the matches that will be played over the weekend, as well as have a look back to what happened before that. But we didn't want to leave you in the lurch. So I thought I'd come on and do a quick roundup of some of the main talking points from this weekend, because it was an exciting round of games, I'll be honest with you. And it showed us a little bit more about what we need to learn from teams who are going to play in the Champions League. Um, specifically, I would say Milan and, and Lazio, who, who had a really terrible time over this weekend. Um, I think it's important that I start with Milan, in fact, because they took on Udinese, who haven't managed a single win this season, who sacked their bo- their coach and brought back Trophy in charge. And so far, he had managed a draw and then a loss in the Coppa Italia, faced Milan and decided that they were going to try to do something special. Now, this should be a game that Milan should have won with relative ease. But at the moment, we're seeing Milan just lose all their bearings at the moment. It seems like a side that just has no understanding of what it's supposed to be doing. There are question marks as to whether or not Stefano Pioli and his tenure at Milan should be over because he's almost outstayed his welcome. Pioli out started to once again trend along social media. And I think most people who have listened to me for a long time know that I'm a big fan of his. Um, but it's very hard. I, I would just, I would argue to defend his tactics at the moment. I understand what it is that he's trying to do, but it's coming across as, as relatively naive at the moment because this is a team that right now just doesn't understand how to work together. And, and the attack is so blunt. In the words of Gazetta, they have doubled their attackers, but halved their efficiency. And I would say that I almost agree with every single word on that. Corriere dello Sport, Tuto Sport, they've all had a shot at, um, at Jovic, um, the striker that was placed alongside Immobile. And the question marks as to why this would happen, considering that both of them are don't move. (laughs) Um, They're they're not players that can work well together. They don't possess the mobility required. They don't enhance the outlets for goal. And this side just doesn't seem to understand how to score a goal. I mean, in over a month now, we haven't seen Rafael Leao actually score a goal. And Giroud has only managed goals against Napoli in over a month as well. This is a team that no longer has the efficiency of what it used to have. I don't want to blame Stefano Pioli. Arrigo Saki doesn't want to blame Stefano Pioli. He actually blames the way that this team has been built. And 
purely argues that actually he's been given everything he's asked for. So this is where it gets really interesting because obviously we were all very exciting, excited and at the start of the season because of what Milan had done on the transfer market, because we thought Ryan does look like a, an unearthed gem that we were dying to watch. We've seen Chocoese and how much he's blown it up in La Liga and thought his pace and ability uh, would be fascinating to watch. Pulisic has always been that player that everyone's wanted to rediscover. Um, the player that lit up the Bundesliga with Dortmund. Um, it would it would be a team that was no longer dependent on Leao, but capable of attacking from all fronts, through the middle, on the on the right, as well as on the left. But what we're seeing right now is a Milan side that looks technically naive and inefficient going forward and still rather dependent on a striker that is very old at this point and can't always guarantee the goals. Um, and I don't know which way to say, but I would say that one thing that was asked of purely is whether or not that they're missing Ibrahimovic. Now, the wider conversation around this is not just about Ibra, but it's about that this team has lost its leaders. And I have to agree with that. You have to understand that there will be consequences when it comes to a side and a club that's important as Milan to the history and the fabric of Italian football, and then you take away the leaders and the people who understand what Milan's importance is, the leaders within it, and that includes Sandro Tonali in the middle, that includes Maldini as a di- Paolo Maldini as a director, that includes Slatan Ibrahimovic as a de facto leader and former star. And you lose all of them in one go and it becomes hard because you look at this team and it is without any Italians. It is except for Calabria, right? It is a team that, and Florenzi as well, actually. But it is a team that right now just look like a group of individuals that don't have that ability to communicate and work together as a team. Stefano Pioli took his time to find that when he first arrived, right? And it, in, he benefited in, in some way from the break that they ha- we had because of coronavirus. And he spoke to the players every day. He told them what his ideals were, what he wanted from this team. And slowly we started to see the, the emergence of his Milan, the, the beauty of it, the cohesiveness of this team. But it did require the help of veterans like Kajer that he had brought in, like, of course, Ibrahimovic. And it helped that he had a management team that was on his side that could talk to these players as well. And I'm not sure that right now they have that. I mean, Moncad is talking about how Jovic is like the greatest player. And it's like, have you seen this guy play? Um, have you seen what he did at Madrid? Nothing, nothing. You, you know, did you see him do something that lit it up at Fiorentina? So I don't know. I mean, I think Pioli deserves to be criticized for some of the way that his, for the way that his team has played, for the lack of efficiency, for the high line that allows them to be so easily, um, beaten, especially by pace, like what PSG have done. But I also think it's worth mentioning that you are going to have problems when you decide to cut ties with players and directors who understood what Milan stands, stands for. I think that's important and there are going to be consequences to that. Just like Chelsea invested heavily in the market, but perhaps lost the essence of what Chelsea was and what it meant. You can't just go and spend money and that's it. You have to understand how to spend it. And and perhaps, yes, a new coach will come in and get it all ticking. We don't know. But I think time will tell us on who really is to blame in all of this. Meanwhile... Uh, Juventus had a very interesting match um, against Fiorentina. I think if there's a a way that we can understand what that game meant, if you didn't watch it, I will give you a quote from Chesney that tells you all you need to know about this particular match. So Fiorentina hosted Juventus and Juventus won 1-0. This was Chesney's comments. The team's unity is crucial. We had difficult moments tonight for circa 89 minutes. But we are happy because it's never easy to win in Florence. I burst out laughing when he, when he said that. <laughs> we had difficult moments tonight for circa 89 minutes. So he's saying that for one minute, they were all right. 
And it was the one minute that Miretti scored his goal, his first senior goal for Juventus at the highest level. And he was ecstatic. I'm not going to lie, I'm a Juve fan. I genuinely didn't think I'd ever see the day where Miretti scored. I mean, most of the time when he's playing, I want to kill him because of the fact that he's so desperate to score this goal. So I hope now that he has indeed scored it, that he has shaken the monkey off his back and he will show us the other facets of his game that are so beautiful and perhaps one that isn't so obsessed with scoring the goals. His goal proved to be the winner. It was fantastic because he scored it very early on, which meant that Juventus could then play the Allegri way, which meant that all players behind the ball defending staunchly. They had four shots on target Juventus throughout the entire game. And sorry, four shots. Three of them were on target efficiency a goal scored from those three meanwhile Fiorentina had 25 shots but only four of them were on target and no goal scored so we certainly know that when it comes to them they don't really have the goal scores necessary Fiorentina at the moment and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a crisis I just don't know whether they really have the team that can I think play on so many different fronts at the moment um they're really missing something in attack. And I think we're, we're seeing that right now. Um, moving on to Inter. They, this is, so Inter's a side that hasn't lost in a weight match. And Atalanta is a side that hasn't lost a home game and hasn't actually even conceded at home because they did get one draw against Juventus, but they didn't concede a goal. So it was who's going to be better. And I think this game was fantastic in the sense that we saw some really good things from both teams. Um, but it was interesting because it's the first time that I've seen Inter take 40 minutes before they had a shot on goal. And their first shot on goal was a penalty that Chanaloglu scored. Conversations are now about whether or not Chanaloglu is the best midfielder in Serie A. His performances this season have been nothing short of fantastic. But as fantastic as he's been, is he Lautaro Martinez? Because this man right now, I mean, me and Nicky go back and forth as to whether he is the best striker. But I have to say so far this season, I have to, I mean, Nicky's, Nicky's like, this is a conversation we need to have. And she's absolutely right. This is a conversation we need to have. This is a man who's now scored 12 goals and 11 appearances. I mean, he's been a streaky player, but this season he has been consistently, consistently amazing to watch. And not just because he scores goals, but because he assists, because he runs, because he's trying in any way, shape or possible to help the team and really show up as a captain. And I think that makes the difference. His ability has always been fantastic. His, the way his feet move, his, his, he can move in tight spaces, his efficiency in front of goal, which we haven't always seen, I would say, in the Champions League. Um, but he is really proving himself this season to be above, above and beyond what we've seen from him in the past. The question always remains on Lataro Martinez, whether or not he can keep it up for the full year. But I completely understand why Giuseppe Marotta, Marotta wants to extend his contract, make him absolutely one of the, one of, if not the highest paid star of Serie A and hopes to keep him at Inter for the longest time possible because right now Martinez is a man who doesn't care about any other club he's not sitting there wondering when his next move to La Liga or the Premier League will be he genuinely loves where he is he's genuinely only focused on Inter and that's exactly the kind of man that you would want in your club mix that with obviously all the other players that they have right now and Inter smiling um it is of course their squad depth it is their ability to introduce different players but it's also having players like Chanaloglu and Lautaro Martinez that make sure that they are a step ahead of teams who function very well as a team like Atalanta who did a great job in this match who came back who scored a goal who came very near and close to equalizing I mean they threw everything at it they looked like they could be if it was just an extra extra 15 minutes we don't know but you fight hard Inter did that, secured the result, and did something no other team has done so far this season, which is win at Atalanta Stadium. Roma had the most exciting match <laughs> possible. I feel like this is Roma, right? Uh, this is what happens. It was Lecce that opened the scoring, and only in stoppage, and sorry, it's important to note that at the very start of the game, in the beginning, Lukaku had uh, his penalty saved and it's the first time that that's happened to Lukaku where he hasn't scored a penalty 
in, um, in, I think this is his 15th try. So 14 out of 14, he scored. And this one, he didn't. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't watch it. So I don't know. All I know is he didn't score the penalty. I didn't watch it until the last effectively 15 minutes actually of the match um, as I was on Premier League duty. So I came in and I didn't watch the beginning of it. But all I could see is that Roma just lose their mind and score two in stoppage time. Um, and thankfully, Lukaku was one of them. And Mourinho said that that was important so that he could sleep well at night. Important also to note that Mourinho's teams just love, love to score in stoppage time. In fact, of the teams that uh, he has coached in Serie A, i.e. Inter and Roma, they've scored 26 goals beyond the 90th minute, um, conceding only three in that same period. And that what we're trying to say here is that this is very, this is evidence of Mourinho teams is that they are fino alla fine, incidentally. Um, they never stop and they always try to find a goal and very good at finding it in the very end of games when they need to. So congratulations to Roma for winning that match. But other than that, what else can we tell you? Um, Lazio. Lazio had a very poor game under Bologna. Uh, against Bologna, rather. To be honest with you, I do think some of the criticism of them is excessive. I I don't know what to make of them because I think that it's obviously a huge loss that they've lost Milinkovic Savage. But I think the biggest problem that they have right now, and I have to agree with Marito Sari, is yes, of course, Milinkovic Savage is a huge loss. But right now, their attack is just not very efficient. They're just not scoring the goals that they should be. And it's not that the chances aren't being created, it's that the goals are not being scored. I mean, for a large part of that first half, they really tried Lazio. They create a lot of opportunities, but they can't do anything after that. They're just creating at this point. And so it becomes very difficult when your team can't seem to finalize that into the actual correct movements required to score a goal. Um, in the second half, Bologna, who is who are a team that are just so well coached right now under Tiago Motta and who have a defender in Calafiori who is proving himself to be something of a, someone that really does possibly need to be um, a mainstay of the national team. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is something the the Italian FA has actually put on their website about how good Calafiori is. So I'm not the only one who thinks so because the Italian FIGC is actually talking about it as well. But his performances at, at the back for Bologna, this is a, a converted fullback. He, it's been astonishing. Um, and Bologna have been very good, even though they don't necessarily have a huge array of attackers, but they work so well as a team and they're so well equipped with various technique. So they've got pace, they've got ability on the ball, they've got courage, they know how to well, work well together, they've got chemistry. And so they can make up for the deficiencies that perhaps they don't have the squad of other sides, but they can make up for that with the way that the team plays. Um, a deserved 1-0 because I thought they defended very well, took their goal very well. Um, which was immediately after in the second half. And unfortunately, that leaves Lazio wondering what's going on because this is their fifth defeat in 11 games. Fifth defeat, that's half of the games that they've played have resulted in a loss. And they need to start winning now in the Champions League. They've got Feyenoord, who are not an easy team. And they've got a lot of energy, Feyenoord. They play with a lot of courage and determination, high tempo. Interested to see what's happening, especially because... Maurizio Sari was hoping that he would have a very full stadium. And as of now, the tickets are not being sold because people care more about the derby that's coming this weekend. Anyway, I've rambled on for so long. I haven't mentioned Frosinone because they did get a two, uh, they, they did score two goals and win against Empoli, who also managed to respond with a goal back of their own. Um, so that's interesting. Um, but I will leave you in the hands of Leo, who has watched Frosinone and asks a pertinent question about Sule. Should Juventus bring him back? Listen to what Leo has to say. We'll be back on Thursday. Ciao for now. Hey guys, um, just following on from the end of last week's pod, uh, the Patreon exclusive bit where you spoke about the epic game between Cagliari and Frosinone. And you guys spoke really well about this exciting young uh, Frosinone team who don't really look like a promotion team this season, but 
the man of the moment as well um, is Matthias Sule, bagging in the goals for Frosinone. Um, and of course, he's on loan from Juventus. And Juventus have been a bit short of a couple of attacking guys. Um, Pogba's been out, Fagioli's been out. So there has been talk um, as of whether Sule would go back in January and could Allegri use him? But then got, that got me thinking, how would Allegri use Sule? He's a right winger um, uh, and Allegri is playing with this quite negative defensive um, setup. So he'd probably play as a right wing back in a, a low possession team. Whereas at the moment, you've got Frosinone, who are, are free flowing, very attacking. So I wonder if that's part of why we're seeing him being successful. Um, some things that are really nice about him is he's very direct. He loves to run at these attackers, get in the box, and he's really calm in front of goals, banging in the goals. Uh, he looks really ice cold um, in front of goal. And then, of course, there's been the other debate, which is he's got an Italian citizenship and he's got an Argentinian citizenship. He played the youth team in Argentina. Um, and uh, But last week he came on record as speaking to Spalletti and saying, hey, look, in my heart, I feel Argentinian. So if I get called up by Argentina, I'm going. So it could be quite bad news for anyone hoping he'd be the future of the Azzurri. Um, but yeah, interesting to hear what you guys think. Do you think this guy should go back to Juve, Mina? Would you have him back? How would he play there or would he just be wasted again? Sports Social Podcast Network. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com slash get100. For a first deposit matchup to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy.